Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the My Game Guys Board Gaming Podcast. I'm your host, Adrian. I'm Zach. And I'm Jeff. And we're here to talk about board games. How's the Broncos doing? God damn it. Why'd you have to bring that up? <laughs> you didn't it's talk good. about it for like three uh, yeah, weeks. Yeah, I know. I keep forgetting. I've gotten out of the habit of talking about the Broncos. You know, we started the show mm-hmm. last time like really close to the beginning of the season so it made sense and then i went a whole off season and not talking about them and forgot and now i really would like to forget about them <laughs> entirely after the last two weeks hey jeff did you know that they had a super long streak of not getting shut out yes really yeah we they had they don't they have i mean it. i know that yeah. yeah so we got shut out on sunday by the uh los angeles chargers now mm-hmm. not the san diego chargers and it ended the nfl's longest shutout streak or no shutout streak uh, that we had running since 1992. Wow. Almost 400 games we went without a shutout until this past Sunday. Uh, it was also the first time since like 2004 that we lost when we held an opposing offense to less than 15 first downs and under 250 total yards. Basically, the defense still played really well and looked really good, but the offense is spiraling out of control. I don't know what's happening. I think they replaced their arms with wet spaghetti. There's, yeah, that something <laughs> happened. I don't know. It's been real bad. I, I, I think a lot of it, like for me, I'm putting it on coaching. We were completely unprepared for the Giants, which there was no excuse for considering we had a bye week the week before we played the Giants. So we should have been very prepared for them. And then the Chargers have the NFL's worst rush defense. And yet we couldn't run the ball against them for shit, which some of that you could put on the players. But I think a lot of it is coaching and play calling is uh, subpar, which to be fair, our coach, this is, was only his fifth ever NFL head coaching like game this last Sunday. Uh, he's brand new head coach for us this year and brand new to head coaching in general. So maybe it'll get better. I don't know. Or maybe they just fire him. Um, yeah, because that's the way the NFL goes now. It's either you win or you get fired. And that's not always the best way to go in my mind, but whatever. I don't own or run an NFL organization. So say la vie. But you can't criticize them to all of your Oh, extent. yeah. Totally can play armchair GM quarterback coach as does every football fan correct yep Yep. correct so it's been pretty brutal uh the last two weeks i'm still vaguely hoping that we can turn it around but at the same time i don't want to you know be totally homer delusional drinking the kool-aid um i think we're in a pretty bad spot right now we'll see how it goes this upcoming weekend when we play division rivals the kansas city chiefs um the chefs the chefs okay uh if we lose to them then we fall even further back in the division and things start to look real ugly if we can somehow manage to put together a decent game against the chiefs who are a pretty damn good team then maybe there's hope we also have a tendency for some stupid reason to play to our competition like when we play really tough teams we play really good when we play really shitty teams we play real bad (laughs) um so i don't know we'll see we will see that's that's your that's your adrian broncos update i'm not drunk enough to really start going off <laughs> uh that i'm dead inside so because the broncos are losing because the broncos are losing amongst other things but the bears, yes. the bears well, are always losing so that's, that's the bears won i know they, they beat the panthers real good yeah 17 to 8 or something no they somehow got eight points <laughs> <laughs> i mean that's not a totally unreasonable score it's not two point conversions yep um or two field goals and a safety Multiple ways. To I would eight. not be shocked if they got like <laughs> four safeties against the Bears. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, the Bears offense is really bad, but their defense looked good. They had two defensive scores in that game on Sunday. It was Ooh. good. Yeah. Uh, no, this is but, now a football podcast. But the, so. Broncos, the Broncos had one defensive score against. No, I guess it was a punt return, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it was a punt return. Good yeah. God. Yep. Good times. Good times. We held them. It was the, the the previous drive. They got down to the one yard line and couldn't score a touchdown in four. They went for it on fourth down. We stuffed them. We got the ball on the one yard line, went, I don't know, 10, 15 yards and then punted and they ran the punt <laughs> back for a touchdown. <laughs> that entire hard work by the defense of, you know, and four <laughs> one yard line stands to and, keep them from scoring. And right back to the goal. Yep. Good times. That was when I really felt all the hope for that game drain away (laughs) Uh, indeed yeah i've been playing not board games yeah yeah what have you been playing uh shadow of war that lord of the rings game oh yeah wasn't there some shenanigans with like pre-orders and Uh, microtransactions microtransactions it was was microtrans you can buy like loot boxes that have like orc like war chiefs and captains in them of like epic and legendary and i haven't found a use to like ever want to do that yet 
but I guess the end end game can get kind of grindy and stuff. But I'm already in like my third area because you conquer fortresses and you do sieges and stuff. And I'm already like I I'm getting tired of captains and war chiefs and fortresses already. Right. Yeah, it's starting to wear a little. It's it's fun, but it's like I can understand that. I'm I'm not getting enough out of it anymore. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. That's a, that was only like 14 hours in or something. Eh, maybe more than that, like 25 hours. It's fun. Eh, it's not my favorite. Yeah, it seemed like it was. It might get to the point of like, uh, oh god, what was that called? The uh, Tim Schafer game with Jack Black. A uh, brutal legend. Brutal legend. Like the first half of the game was mm-hmm. great, and then like the second half, it's like now it's an RTS, and you're like, wait, what? What? <laughs> uh, but yeah, Shadow War. It's it's okay. Cool. I uh, for not board game related gaming, I. Uh, played through uh, Spec Ops: The Line, uh, which is a good game. Just like a few days like ago, the, for the first time, for the first time ever. It's As been re- it's been in Steam, my Steam library for a long time. It's a real good game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it was real trippy. Yeah, uh, and real dark. Yep. Um I almost want to play through it again and try and see if I can actually understand exactly what was going on. <laughs> um, it left me with a little bit of a like, wait, what the fuck? Yeah, uh, that's the point of the game. Yeah. And then I also played through and beat uh, Banner Saga, which is ah. like an indie style with a little bit of RTS or not not RTS um, turn based like yeah. battles and grid grid combat, yeah, RPG elements and stuff. It was real good too. Yeah, I liked it a lot. There's a third one that just got figged or Indiegogoed or something like that. Yeah, the first two were Kickstarters. I didn't know yes. they had already done a third one. Yeah, I, just uh, recently. I'm now looking to pick up the second one and continue the story. I got the second one on a humble monthly bundle recently. Cool. Yeah. Uh, any video gaming you want to talk about, Zach? Since we're we're covering all types of gaming, sports gaming, right. video yeah. gaming. <laughs> I played. Uh, I I played, started, and finished Uncharted: Lost Legacy. Mm-hmm. The like what was originally going to be DLC, and they're like, oh, we made too much for this. Now we're going to have be a full blown game for but for forty dollars instead of sixty. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, if you like four, it's more of that. More Uncharted. Yes. I don't think I played four. I think I've only ever played three. I've played one, two, and three. I, I felt like four was like a little bit too long because it was like I feel like it was fifteen plus hours. This one was like six or seven, so I played it in like over like three sessions. It was a lot of fun. Right on. Uh, and then uh, I, I played through that because I had a, a backlog of stuff to get to before I already play the things i just bought south park the fractured butthole <laughs> <laughs> yep uh that one is uh like a rpg sort yeah, of it's thing. an rpg yeah. it's like straight up rpg yeah it's, uh, it's a lot of fun so far the story behind that title is they actually wanted to call it the fractured butthole mm-hmm. but then they wouldn't they weren't allowed to so they called it the fractured butthole, butthole. yep and then they're like that's A-okay. and that's perfectly fine yep the yep. same words are happening <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah uh hooray for Matt Stone trade. Whatever yes. regulations it, that are stupid and pointless. And I think it was the publisher. Yeah. U- Ubisoft. Yes. Uh, it still, lo- it still looks surprised. like you're watching the show, so, which is great. Yeah. yeah. I played Stick of Truth and really enjoyed it. It was a little short for what I wanted out of one of their games, but I yeah. liked it. Uh, it definitely felt like South Park. Then I feel like this one's just like a more polished superhero version of that, which is, for me is better because I, you know, I don't care about Lord of the Rings. So Fair enough. Yeah. Unless it's Shadow of War, mm-hmm. clearly. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, how this starts is Cartman like realizes that a cat has gone missing, and there's a hundred dollar reward. So he wants to go. He goes, quote unquote, back in time to uh, to basically uh, stop crime. And so he goes back as the coon, <laughs> <laughs> um, and he go. It basically is the f- the the finale of the Stick of Truth, and he basically jumps in. He's just like, "All right, guys, this is all stupid. We're playing superheroes now." And uh, then they're like, "Okay." <laughs> and then so literally like right they're, they're fighting a dragon and then he's like no we're doing this now and then i was like oh, okay and so everybody that isn't the four main characters are just standing there like wait what um <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah it was a lot of fun it's a lot of it's been a lot of fun so far so. i don't yeah um what board games have y'all been playing jeff mm. anything the does driving a forklift count as playing a board game it i I don't know. It depends on... I mean, it's like a giant dexterity. What happens game. if you win? Uh, I get paid. Money. And no one dies. It's basically like but, victory points. Yeah. And everyone stops yelling at me to move shit out of the way. 
<laughs> that might be even more valuable than the money. Yeah. Uh, Stop yelling at me. <laughs> Stop yelling at me. Stop making more beer. I don't have room for it anymore. Uh, it's just me weeping openly at work on a forklift. <laughs> <laughs> I've literally played nothing since we reviewed Lisboa. Okay. Board game wise. Gotcha. That's unfortunate. Yes. It's very unfortunate. Uh, Zach, what about you? Have you played board games? Uh, I played Matryoshka again. I enjoyed okay. that. Um, that was pretty good. I yeah. played it with you. Uh, I played Biblios again. Mm-hmm. Uh, we played that over the weekend. That's P- We actually played it correctly this yes. time. Yes. Which definitely changed the feel of the game. It I don't know did. how much actually changed the game. I mean, it changed in the sense, like before we would draw four cards. And then, or however many cards you're supposed to, all at once, and then decide where, like, which ones go in the auction pile, which one goes to you, and then which ones are getting face up. Whereas now you just do it one at a time. So you look at a card and you're like, this one's good, but like, do I, do I want to hold out for something better, or do I want to just throw in the auction, or do I want to let one of them have it? And uh, I thought that added a little interesting aspect to the game. Yeah. It was definitely relieving when it worked out right. Like, oh, this is a really crappy card. I'll do it face up. This one's a really crappy card. I'll do it face up. This one's not too bad. I'll put it in the auction pile. All right, let's see what I get to take home with me. Oh, sweet. This card's yep. really good. I mean, I always found it funny when it was just like, all right, the two things up for like for people to grab are one money and two money. So what choice would you like to make, Adrian? Would you like two money or one money? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I had one card at the end save my ass because I happened to save enough money to buy the make two dice go up one. And bas- it was the only ones that I actually had any sort of uh, cards in. And so that let me go from being last to for, uh, tied for first. And then I won because I had extra money left. <laughs> yeah. With the tiebreaker. Yep. Um, yeah. I like Biblios. Mm-hmm. It's a fun little game. Yeah. I've played it, I think, once or twice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a good filler one. Right. So. So I'd I'd recently gotten Card City uh-huh. uh, from one of Alvin Viard's latest Kickstarters, and it's actually Card City XL, which conveniently is CCXL, which is 240, which they claim is how many ways there are to play the game. Which is technically correct, but you're not going to play it 140 different ways. No, definitely that, not. Because it starts with three different ver- uh, uh, level difficulties, yeah. simple, intermediate, and advanced. Simple, normal, and advanced. There you go. And after playing simple once... We were like, yeah, no. Right. We would just do normal or advanced. It, so it, immediately, that's one third of the game's gone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and personally, like, I think even even after doing a little bit more, I'd say, you know, unless you're playing with all new people, then you can do normal. Mm-hmm. But even even then, like, intermediate and normal don't either want to add so much more oversimplified that it's not a, that there's a good reason to not just play with normal or simplify or advanced. Uh, advanced. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, what are you doing in Card City, Zach? Uh, you're getting car- you're you're building your city with cards. Um, <laughs> Correct. <laughs> yes. Uh, so you have every round you get a certain amount of cards, and you you basically it has like a you split or I split you choose sort of mechanism, and that you put two cards face up. Like this is the simplified one that we played. You put two cards face up, and then you put um, if you're playing with three other people, so four total, you have eight in total. It's two times the amount of people playing. Uh, so that one, you'd have six cards off to the side. Three of them are face up, three of them are face down. And then the person to your left either chooses to take those two cards or to let you take those two cards, and then they take those six cards. And so there's a couple different types of cards. There's commercial, residential, industrial, parking, and leisure. Luxury. 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 And... Uh, there's like there's certain ways that you're allowed to set up things like residential. You can't put another card next to residential. You have to sort of let it grow. Same thing with commercial. Industrial can't be put uh, placed next to residential, and vice versa. Um, and so there, you you only play on a five by five grid. So as you which start, that's only in the simplified. Oh, it's six normal by six. and above. It jumps to six by okay. six. Okay. Well, I'm still I'm still assuming that once once it starts getting later and later, it gets harder to to find certain Correct. spots for your cards to go in. Correct. Um. And then basically you just keep doing that. You get money based on like your commer- your uh, commercial properties and then any municipal ones you have and stuff like that. And you get money, which is points, but also lets you buy industrial, which allow you to get more cards onto your... Uh, it allows your city to support more cards, basically. Right. Because it's originally like five, and then it adds five for every industrial card you put on there. Yeah. So. So you have to have basically enough industry to support a large city, yes. Uh, which you know makes sense thematically. And then uh, your commerce at the end of each round, you score money for mm-hmm. your chains of commerce. And then 
depending on the victory condition, the one we played was the residential victory condition where big blocks of residences give you increasingly large amounts of points and you're seeing who has the most points. Which some of us like didn't really realize until like halfway through or yeah. like, Which, there's, like, like especially def- you because you're... Well, not, I don't. Well, I, I realized, like, yeah. but I just I messed up in how to grow. Like the way I built my city, it didn't leave a lot of options for to grow yeah. my residences. And then for residences to grow, they need um, luxuries nearby or municipal um, or municipal, which there wasn't a lot of available. And so it, until the end, <laughs> until the very end, and by then a lot of it. Sometimes it was too late. It was like, oh, yeah. Well, if I place this here, it would let my residential grow. Unfortunately, that also blocks the only place that my residences can grow. Yeah. So I'm screwed. Uh, I ended up trouncing everybody in that game because yeah. uh, money is also five money. I don't, I don't remember if they actually had denomination of money in that. No. Okay. Five money is one point. And I was getting 30 money a turn <laughs> near yeah. the end. Uh, so every turn, I was just getting six points, and I didn't even have to spend it. So I was just stockpiling it. Yeah, I uh, I had more I had more points from money than anybody else did otherwise. Right. Like yeah. Wes that was, was second. Ouch. He had thirty two points. I had thirty six points in money. It was pretty ridiculous. <laughs> we, we were finding things because I'd forgotten the actual money that came with the game because I'd been bagging things up and sorting them, and I left the money on the couch. And so we robbed the money from Isle of Sky, which only goes up to twenties. And Zach we had to was use like, a bus pass. Yeah, we found a we found a bus pass that we were like, this is now a hundred dollar bill <laughs> uh, <laughs> for scoring purposes. So I think a, a lot of it was we didn't really know the right. cards that well in the beginning, so mm-hmm. we kept putting like commercial and residentials together, and I I kept taking those, and that allowed me to grow it in ways that I had a seven long chain of commercial districts, which was that, ridiculous. It sounds nice. Yeah. It's because you get money for every... So if you have one commercial district, you get one money. If you get two that are connected, the first one gets one money, the second one gets two money. Mm-hmm. A third would get three money, so that's already six. And it's... um, I forget what that's called. Yeah, I don't know if that... I don't think that's technically logarithmic, is it? No, it's uh, it's like the... Whatever the exclamation point is, but with adding instead of multiplying. That's what that is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, I'll fancy Google- math terms. Yes. I'll uh, <laughs> Google that later. I can, yes. <laughs> Yeah, and so then I uh, we, we played that at game night, and it went pretty well. Uh, played pretty quick. Um, yeah, after we were done, though, I was like, if 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 I have a chance to play the simplified version of this again, I will not do it. Yeah, so. it, there's really not much there. Um, so then I came home, and the I think it was the next night even. I think it was like Thursday night. I was sitting around the house um, watching Netflix or whatever and decided to bust out the solo version and kind of see how that went. So I decided to play with uh, the advanced rules, and the solo variant really doesn't change much. You're just it, there's a score sheet on the in the back of the rule book that's like if you get this many points, you score this on this chart, and so you just keep playing to get the best score you can get. Um, and so a couple of the changes jumping up from the simplified version to the larger one, you're now building uh, a six by six grid. So instead of getting two cards a turn like in the simplified, you get three cards a turn which changes how you lay those cards out in that i pick you cho- or i cut you choose section mm-hmm. so in normal and above you lay three cards out with two face up one face down and that's like the hand that somebody can take and then you lay the other ones with a third of them face up so if there's six remaining you do two face up four face down and that's where they can take those and then do the i cut you choose again uh which i think i would like to i'm interested in playing that in uh, with other people, because having the a face down card in both piles, I think allows you to be a little bit sneakier. Like you could put two really good cards face up, and then one really bad card face down, and try and get them to take that, and then hope that you know maybe that you could ultimately leave yourself something positive, yeah. uh, hidden. Like then in the last round when you're showing, you know, just the like pick this one or pick this one. In the simplified version, it was two face up, and then. One face up, one face down. So I, I remember there was at least one situation where the card, one of the cards that, uh, like, uh, not Jeff, Wes had given you the option for the four was was a luxury, and then you pick that up, and I'm like, so just so you know, Adrian, I know there's a luxury in there, and you either are gonna give it to me from the two cards, or you're gonna try and hide it, and I'm gonna take that card, the, that the hidden card. So yeah. no matter what, I'm getting that luxury. <laughs> yeah, but then the problem is that then, like if I put it face down and you take those, well then you have to cut. 
and let somebody else choose. So then it's the same thing. They could just be like, well, Zach, I better see that luxury or... Yeah. No, I know. That's what I'm saying. So at, at the simplified one, at some point, it, like if they aren't well distributed, then it's just like, okay, I know that one's coming. So... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which in those other ones, having having one face down in both piles mm-hmm. lets you kind of be sneaky. Like, oh, Zach, which one of these face down cards do you think is that luxury exactly, card? Exactly, yeah. Uh, And then they have different scoring conditions, which I think are kind of interesting. I really want to play like the industry one um, where you get a lot of points for different industry related things, industry and I think commerce uh, score you points and money is extra points. Um, They also add like pollution cards in and some other things like that. Uh, Yeah, that sounds more interesting. Yeah. And those kinds of things just affect how you build your city. Like the pollution cards come into play. Like if you build an industry card, that is in the same row or column as any other industry card. You have to add a pollution card to your city, and they're worth minus two points at the end of the game. Okay. Um, so it kind of makes it trickier to place your industry cards because you'll need to build several of them to support a six by six city. And gotcha. Yeah. Um, I like it. I'm really wanting to play more of it. Reminds me of Quadropolis for no reason. I'm uh, sure. I could no. I could see some similarities there, like you know, city building different yeah. districts. They score points based on adjacency and to- things. Yeah. Definitely some similarities not the, there. Not the drafting right. portion there, but it's I cut you choose instead of I play this guy that gets me that one in there. And <laughs> right. I want the one that's four in, please. Um, yeah. So we played that a game night, um, and then I played a whole bunch more of Dutch Blitz, which I did really good at this time. I got beat real bad when I first learned Dutch Blitz. That's a whole lot of fun. Really fast-paced, card-slappy game, kind of like speed. Um, but The drug? Yes, the drug, clearly. Methamphetamines. It comes with methamphetamines. Yes, uh, for hard mode. Yeah. <laughs> Advanced players only. Uh, no, but the game I really want to talk about was last Friday. I oh, gotta, yeah. I got to play that this weekend, yeah. Uh, so last Friday is a one versus all hidden movement game where the one is the maniac and the all is the campers. And this is in one of the thinnest veiled... Like, how are you not being sued for copyright infringement games ever? <laughs> like, it's it's real close to just straight up being... Um, Friday the 13th, yeah. the board game? Yeah. Does but, he wear a hockey mask? No, but at one point you do see a character, one of the uh, player characters, the campers, one of them is carrying a hockey mask. Uh, so they even have the hockey mask in there. And there's little machetes here and there and all kinds of... Gotcha. Stuff that's very clearly like, this is heavily inspired by the movie. Uh, is it on a camp by the lake? It is. Okay. Most certainly. Yeah. So I played as the maniac because I like to play as the one in one versus all games. You just don't like working with people. I get it. I, I do not. I don't get along with others. Um, I, instead, I want to murder them. Uh, Understandable. So the game plays out over four rounds. In the first round, the maniac and the campers all have like predetermined starting spots. Uh, the campers all have very specific ones like based on their color. The maniac gets to choose like one of six spots around the edge of the board. Um, and then the f- in the first round, the goal of the campers is just to get inside of a cabin, find the keys, get inside the cabin where you'd be safe. Uh, and the maniac's goal is to kill the campers. Uh, the maniac can technically win in the first phase if he kills all of the campers, which it, this game plays six players. So I was the maniac. There were five campers. And you always play with all five, no matter how many actual players you have. But uh, So basically, this is the Fury of Dracula spinoff that everyone's been waiting for. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't... Like, the maniac can technically win, but I don't see it being realistic. Um just because like you start far enough away on the edge of the board and the players can move quick enough and have enough like some of them should survive uh you know as it was i only able, i was only able to kill one of them in the beginning uh which ended up cascading uh making the game harder for me because at the end of each round if there are more campers alive than there are corpses the campers get to look at uh little clues that are around the map that basically if you go to that spot, you get a bonus like a bear trap or a lantern or a shovel, things like that. Uh, Whereas if there are more corpses than there are surviving um, campers, then the maniac gets to refresh some of his ability tokens that he can spend. And since I was only able to kill one of them and it starts with two corpses on the board, uh, I was, it was three to four. And then they managed to clean up one of the corpses. So it ended up being 
four to two. And so I didn't get to refresh any of my abilities going into the next rounds, uh, which really hurt me. Uh, in the second round, the Maniac cannot win and the campers can't win either. But uh, essentially in that one, they turn and they are trying to kill the Maniac. And so if they manage to kill him, whoever killed him, they become the Chosen. Uh, otherwise, if the Maniac survives for the entire round, then the campers get rid of all their stuff. Um, in this particular game, it we even talked about it a little bit. I was like, guys, help me understand here. Like, is there a reason for me to want to survive? Like, what do I get out of surviving? And the answer was not much. And so I just threw myself at the nearest camper and died. Um, so then you move into the third round. And in the third round, the Maniac, this is the main round where the Maniac can really win. And their goal is to kill the Chosen from the previous round. Um, whereas the other campers are trying to keep the Chosen alive. And the Chosen is, you know, trying to stay alive. Then in the fourth and final round, they are back to hunting the Maniac. And if as the Maniac, you can stay alive for the entire round, you win. Otherwise, if they kill you, they win. And they super cornered me and super killed me. <laughs> super died. Um, yeah. I did not care for this game. <laughs> um, uh -huh. This has been my least favorite of the kind of hidden role or hidden movement one versus all type games. I felt the maniac for being a murderer maniac in a horror movie was super underpowered. Um, you know, I it, it I just I felt like I couldn't really ever do much like to to affect the game. Like I felt really impotent for most of the game. Um, whereas the campers like when it was their turn, it was you know, there's five of them running around the board, like trying to kill me. It's really hard to stay alive, especially because during those rounds where they can kill you every three turns, you have to announce where you are um, because it's daytime and they can see you moving or something. But it makes it really hard to stay hidden from them when you're constantly announcing where you are. So huh. uh, I want to play it again now that we understand the game and see if maybe like understanding the game will help because when we first sat down, none of us knew it. And so we were all just kind of guessing at things. Whereas now I think like as the maniac, I do things differently. Uh, which might change things, but who knows? Uh, yeah. Looks interesting. That was last Friday. There is an expansion that it basically adds a seventh player, and it becomes Freddy versus Jason versus the campers. That oh, sounds a one versus one versus all. <laughs> uh, return to Camp Apache. Yeah. And the box cover is basically like, it looks like Freddy versus Jason. Like nice. there's a murderer with a machete and kind of a mask. And then, like, you see, like, one hand down with these big, like, claws hanging off of it. It's like, okay, again, how are you not being sued for copyright infringement? That's, because to it, that's totally Wolverine claws. That's definitely I, yeah. not I mean, Freddy Krueger. No, no. Subtle it, differences. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, and that's not that's not red and green stripes. That's green and red stripes. <laughs> yep. uh -huh. There's a specific difference. Yeah. And there's no way he's not wearing a mask, right? It's just really dark. Yeah, no, it's not totally a mask <laughs> of some kind. Yeah, but it's a black mask. Uh -huh. So it's yeah. It's not a hockey mask. <laughs> nope. So um yeah, that was last Friday. It's a field hockey mask. Yes, that's it. <laughs> Jesus. Uh Jeff, still no bloody minute this this go around. Uh I talked about it last time, right? Yeah. I won. Uh, really, really good. My next game is against the Dwarves. Uh, they are the champions from last season. Uh, they Their team value is about 250K over mine. Uh-oh. Uh, yeah. You need inducements for that? Uh, yep, but I bought a troll because uh, I'm going to go troll chainsaw on this hot. next play. Uh, I'm going to be playing next week. Not in time for next week's recording, but the day after. Uh, so we'll we'll see how things go. Right troll, troll chainsaw. So two weeks till the next bloody minute. Yep. And cool. uh, we'll see how I get smashed by the dwarves. Right on. Who are more bashy than my orcs. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be rough. Dwarves are super slow, but they have the high armor, and he has enough skills on his guys that he can, he can bash uh, probably better than I can. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Right on. We'll see. Well, I think that wraps up uh, all of the bantery type things. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's end is moving to strange. Yeah, That's, Wits End is, is going to become roommates with Strange, and Strange is going to brew their beer on their system and have what, their beer on their taps. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how that works. We can cut, one of, our, cut one of our game night rotations out because they're both going to be in the same yep. spot. Yeah, which I'm actually totally cool with because I really like Wits End beer, but I feel like the Strange has a better location, yeah. Yeah. and so now best of both worlds. Yep. Mm -hmm. So We get to have two different breweries in the same brewery. Yeah. Yeah. Very exciting stuff. Yep. Right. Uh... Is it news time? I think it's news time.
news. There's a lot of it. Um, 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 I'm just saying, um, um no, I have it pulled up. <laughs> <laughs> First up in news, uh, Feast for Odin is getting a mini expansion. And by uh, what I mean, mini is probably the smallest expansion I've ever seen for anything. This is basically promos. Uh, <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> it's, it's two new island tiles, which is an interesting way to expand on your game simple and easily but yeah it's it's two new it's two new island tiles for feast of feast road um i'm not even gonna try uh, tierra del fuego and lofton lofoten lofoten i don't know um or- but down in the actual- orkney islands yeah <laughs> uh which i don't see the weapon card uh yeah no i don't see the weapon card it's uh, because they didn't they didn't show it so is it more than it's it's double-sided because they were always double-sided yeah yeah, and they don't show like they only the show new, two sides. Yeah, so. and they don't show the new feature that they're actually putting on yeah. the islands. And they only list three, but if they're double sided, there should be maybe a fourth one. So who knows? But if you need new islands because you got tired of playing Feast for Odin over and over again, and you're like, man, I could use some new islands. Everything else is fine, but I'm getting super tired of just islands. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Coming soon. <laughs> Uh, next up on news, a self-taught AI, uh, will destroy you at go. (laughs) Um, so an AI from, uh, Google owned, uh, DeepMind. It's, uh, called AlphaGo Zero. So the first one was AlphaGo. That was their, their, their last, uh, Go AI that ended up beating the Go masters. I forget what they're called. Yeah. Um, and so they made a new one. AlphaGo Zero, which is, self, like you said, self-taught. It has no human input in it, and it destroyed uh, Alpha Mi- or Alpha Go, the wow. first one, like 100 to zero or something like that. Like the AI beat the other AI? Yeah. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. I've never played Go, but I've heard that playing an AI is a good way to learn. I've, I've <laughs> yeah. played uh, Go a lot. It's a good game. Uh, it's hard. I can see how there's a lot of like in-depth strategy. Like It's one of the oldest games known and... I know, like, it's said to be super, super in-depth strategies and things like that. And as is often the case, AI is demolishing everybody at it. So, yeah, if you need to play Go against an AI, I mean, now there's a new one for you to do that, too. Yep. That's, and get ruined. Uh, I'm not sure how easy it is to just go play against these AIs. Hey, Google, I want to play a game of Go against your super good AI. You, you're too shitty, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> It's like uh, I'm get going, good, son. Yeah, I'm going to destroy your phone now because you don't deserve it. <laughs> just no. <laughs> Screen goes black and just starts sizzling. <laughs> yep. Smoke. Smoke starts shooting out of it. Next up. Next up in news, uh, Eclipse is getting a second edition, which sure reminds me a lot of Ti Four mm-hmm. and how they did their edition. Uh, it should be out next year, but it's going to have new graphic design. Uh, the first expansion or the the ship the first ship expansion ship pack one yeah which were basically custom ships, ships for, for all each race. Yeah, yeah. Race. uh new minis uh custom made plastic inlays which thank god uh custom dice and fine-tuned gameplay which means <laughs> rule changes yeah <laughs> uh but i think yeah that uh the the plastic inlays that's great oh yeah it, that's it really needed it it was basically terraforming mars level of like player maths yeah. like Good luck keeping all these cubes on here. Yeah. Well, I don't know if... Th- it wasn't as bad as Terraforming because at least it had no. different colors. Yeah. Do you th- Is that what you think they mean by plastic inlays? Because I Or are you talking about insert? I thought... I was thinking insert. Inlays, inlays. tend... They usually say inlays for the, uh, like player, the player board thing. Which is still awesome. Yeah. Uh, because it is definitely a game, much like Terraforming Mars, where there's a whole lot of little cubes that have very specific spaces. Yes. And heaven forbid you jumble them up. Because then you're fucked. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah. They yeah. actually come out next year after they finish it. 2018. Yup. Eclipse, second dawn of the galaxy. Yeah, because the first one Wait, is a new dawn. Sorry. Second dawn for the galaxy. Yes. <laughs> so this is the next day. <laughs> uh, I really like Eclipse. 24 a, hours remaining. Really good game. And initially I was like, what the hell? I don't No, Not another new edition. I don't want to spend money on a new edition and then i read through what's coming in it and it was like well fuck i'm gonna be spending money on a new edition <laughs> guess i gotta buy this now yeah uh, maybe they'll have some kind of upgrade kit where i can just get the inlays and the upgraded ship pack stuff and the rule changes maybe no probably not doubt it it's new art 
which makes me happy. Next yeah. up. Uh, next up, WizKids and Games Workshop are going to make some Warhammer 40k games and some other stuff. Uh, so they're going to make 40k dice building games, which I think the the X Men dice build dice masters. That's WizKids. Yeah. So it's basically going to be dice masters 40k, most likely. Um, but they've also said that they are going to be republishing uh, Fury of Dracula and Relic. Uh, Fury of Dracula, of course. Uh, famously set in the uh, Warhammer 40k universe. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, it's just you know forty thousand and like one hundred years before Warhammer forty thousand. Yeah. Yeah. It's on like regular Earth. <laughs> yep. Clearly. Yeah. With Dracula. Yes. <laughs> There's Draculas. Space Draculas. <laughs> <laughs> so this is before they went to space. Yes, this is before okay. they went to space. Uh, and Relic, which is the Talisman 40K game. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so, yeah, Fury Dracula, f- the fourth edition, coming yeah. sometime. Yeah. I, I, I know a lot of us thought when Games Games Workshop cut out Fantasy Flight, they're like, oh, they're going to go out on their own and do this and stuff? No. I guess they're just like, no, nah, we don't want to do deal with Fantasy Flight anymore. We'll go with WizKids. Yeah. Uh, now soon coming coming in the next two years, Games Workshop pulling its license from WizKids and Fury of Dracula Fourth Edition going out of print. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but maybe I'll get that Dice Masters game because I'm an idiot. Um, <laughs> uh, next up in news, uh, just newly announced. Not many details out yet, but Blade Runner 2049 Nexus Protocol. I. Uh, Blah, not hidden role social deduction game uh where you're hunting replicants but you don't know if you're a replicant or not which seems interesting yeah it's a yeah everybody's like you're trying because there's only one replicant and then like halfway through the game or sometime at some point the replicant will figure out that they're the replicant and then that's when they're like oh fuck i can't let i did such a good job of trying to find the replicant before but now I'm, now is now, now i gotta do a shitty job now i have to <laughs> run yes <laughs> Uh, scramble to conceal your identity and avoid early retirement. That's death. Yeah, that, that, means, that is that, that is dying. death because um, you got shot. Yeah, in the face. Yeah, we're the back of that. One of the tentatively uh, interested in this one. I, yeah. I think it'll be interesting to see how the mechanic works for revealing who's actually the replicant. And because like it says in the little blurb on BGG that like you know if you discover that you're the replicant, all of a sudden you have to start backtracking. Like oh shit, I I did a lot of good research mm-hmm. and now I know that it's me and. Oh shit. Yep. <laughs> so that'll be interesting. You could be like, guys, guys, I got it all wrong. <laughs> Everything I've said all game, disregard that yes. for <laughs> reasons. Yeah, we've got to trash the whole thing and start back from ground up. Yeah. Uh, uh, I got this Ouija board and it's going to tell us who the replicant uh-huh. is. <laughs> it's like nobody is the replicant. <laughs> that uh, that Blade, new Blade Runner movie was real good. Yep. I still need to watch it. I Please do. Because it made not as much money. <laughs> it as they made were a they, poor uh, amount of money. They, they're pulling. They've been pulling it early, so because it didn't make a lot of money. So that's unfortunate. Like from theaters. Yes. Yeah. Well, hopefully, I can still find a showing. Yeah. It was like it did like thirty-four million of its like one hundred and fifty million dollar budget with like combined with marketing stuff closer to three hundred million dollars. Three hundred million dollars, like yeah. doubled the budget in just Mar- marketing tends to be like Jesus. a lot. So, so it made ten percent. Which is well, stupid because they overmarket things all the time. Yeah, but and their marketing was good. I thought yeah. their marketing was just fine. I wanted to no spoilers. The, yeah, no spoilers that's in marketing. What, so I actually saw a thing. Someone was saying that uh, the one of the reasons they didn't well, perform well is because like a, a a major part of the movie going people are one like very very casual ones. Like they like to know what they're getting into. So they tend to prefer the trailers that have more information in it. Uh-huh. Uh, so they can be like, okay, this looks like something I'd want to watch. Yeah. Um, and so they felt like the uh, the movie going base was a lot narrower than they'd like because of that. But yeah. uh, Denny Villeneuve was like, no. <laughs> no, I stand by my decisions. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I certainly appreciate the spoiler-free stuff. And the only reason I didn't watch it opening weekend was because that was the weekend that I became fun employed. And so I was cutting back on That my, seems uh, like a great time to go I see am, a movie. Yeah. Yeah, to go spend money that I'm no longer making. $5? Alamo? Yeah. I meant to go see it yesterday, Matinee. but I forgot. Yeah. We'll go so. see it tomorrow. Well, it's not $5 tomorrow. Yeah, it's not $5 tomorrow. It's only Is it only weekends? It's, it's only Sunday. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's it. Last bit of news. For news. For that piece of news. Yeah, last, last, bit, 
Last bit. In thoroughly ridiculous news. Uh Uh-huh. Thoroughly ridiculous news. Uh, Sony Pictures seeking to create Catan, the movie franchise. (laughs) Uh, They're negotiating to try and get Catan into a movie and possible sequels. Uh, This article is really funny because they like, could Knights and Seafarers become future movies? Is the franchise pivot towards attracting five to six additional moviegoers? (laughs) because <laughs> it's five six player expansions yes yes uh i guess the guys that are doing like pr- the producers that are on this i don't know what pawn sacrifice is but it's I've heard, a movie about bobby fisher okay uh i've heard of the perfect storm and in the line of fire and air force one but i don't know how well that translates into a Catan movie <laughs> right <laughs> uh Another producer from, like, The Departed, Terminator Salvation, which is the best Terminator movie. Uh, sh- I mean, second to Genesis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and, like, the Lego movies. Yeah. Uh, and the recent uh, It, the It remake, which oh. went really well. Yeah, that's true. Um, I really like the blurb they have where it says, we're excited to be working with Sony to bring the iconic world of Catan to life. Hmm. There's nothing iconic about the world of Catan. It's wood, sheep, brick, and... I better play. see a sh- I better see somebody holding up sheep. Be like, who the fuck wants these sheep? Like that's the one fuck they use in the PG thirteen. Yeah, <laughs> somebody take this fucking sheep from me. I have no use for it. And then a ba- and then a bandit just walks by. And, and I re- and I really want to see at some point somebody go. I'll trade you wood for sheep. And they go, okay, here. And he goes, no, 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 no. I meant I want wood. And I'll give sheep. And they go, oh, well, never mind then. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a movie of people but, playing Catan. But make it tenser than what Adrian said. <laughs> yes. Like, very, very suspenseful. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Not looking forward to that. Shocker. Yeah, I don't, I don't see how that could ever be good. That's it for news. That is it for news. There was a bunch of, there was a bunch of good news this week. Yeah. Uh, there's also a bunch of good Kickstarters... Uh, first up in the Kickstarter realm is Champions of Midgard, official insert, uh, cause this game needed a new insert. Wooden insert. Wooden insert. It's official, licensed, I guess. Uh, well-funded, 8,300 of its $6,600 goal, 145 backers, and a little under two weeks to go, and you can back this one for about $40. Zach, yeah. are you going to be backing this for your massive Champions of Midgard purchase that you recently made? Probably not. I don't know. We'll see. I'm a little little miffed just because... I mean, I was sort of disappointed with the plastic insert that the big box, the Kickstarter exclusive box came with. Uh-huh. Um, and then so I was, I was looking in this one and the pictures show it with just the regular Champions of Midgard oh. box, which I threw those away. Um, oh But... It looks that a uh, yeah a uh, a stretch goal <laughs> is just a big piece of foam <laughs> to put it underneath so it can fit into the big box. <laughs> right there, it's, uh, it's the best stretch goal of all time. One yeah. giant piece of foam. Uh, Zach, I definitely have two centimeter thick foam. No, I know. If I you know. just get the regular one right? and yeah. they don't reach that stretch goal, I'll still provide you with a piece of foam. But it's also like forty bucks, and then it's also fifteen bucks shipping too. Uh. Ooh, yeah. $55. Yeah. Another one of those games where you can spend as much on the insert as you did on the game. Now, if, if I didn't have any insert, then it's like, oh, maybe. But like the plastic one, I'm like 80% satisfied with it. And I don't know. <laughs> I want to spend 55 bucks on just for that extra 20%. And then I'm going to have to glue this, glue this shit together. And it might not get burned in. Uh, the burned in symbols and stuff like that. If it doesn't reach the stretch goals. I don't know. I, I'm glad that they're doing it. I just wish that it was cheaper. Okay. Understandable. It, it's being made in Poland, so like 100% in Poland. Yeah, right on. Uh, well, if they get to 25,000 GBP, you get a wooden axe first player marker, which that alone has got to be worth like 10 bucks, right? In a right. 3D round marker? Right. I, I definitely click to remind me, so we'll <laughs> see. <laughs> but uh, Right on. Uh, well, that is Champions of Midgard. Insert. Oh, official wooden insert. And, and the one problem, you couldn't sleeve the cards for the old insert right yeah or so. for the small ones and okay this one i'm not sure if i can do that or not i, I can't tell i'd have to ask it me. looks like there's room for it like just looking at the picture of where the small cards go it looks like there's plenty of room on the ends and on the sides for sleeved cards i mean it looked like here it looks like all the small cards are it's like basically flush with both sides it'd be crazy if you 
made an insert like that to not be able to hold. Space. Yeah, I, I, I thought I'd say the same thing about that plastic insert, and yet they proved me wrong. Yes. No one would sleeve this game. Our game is garbage. Why would anyone want yeah. to preserve it? Here, let us sell you sleeves. Yeah. This is literally what happened. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, I was like, oh, they have a full set of sleeves. I'll do it. And then I'm like, I can't. And it doesn't fit in the answer. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, Champions Midgard official wooden insert. Uh, next up on Kickstarter is Dice Hospital. Um, this one is well-funded, 152000 of its $16,000 goal, about 1,900 backers, but this one's only got about a week left. You can pledge this one for uh, about $49. Or, oh yeah, that's a, it's a different one where you can pledge way higher. Yeah, there's um, also one for $80 that gets you a bunch all, of other... All of the stretch goals. Yes. The $49 one only gets you certain stretch goals. It, gets you, it says all stretch goals. The other one just has like deluxe add-ons. Uh, I must, uh, I must have been thinking expansions. of a different one that I was looking at that had multiple. Yeah, it's basically just deluxe stuff. Yep, deluxified. Uh, so this is an interesting... No, that's TMG. TMG isn't doing this. It's an interesting uh, kind of worker placement dice manipulation game. Uh, so basically at the start of each round, you're going to roll a bunch of dice and they're going to go onto these ambulance cards. And then going around in player order, you're going to pick one of the ambulances and take the dice off of it and then put them into your wards in your hospital. And which ambulance you take determines the next round of turn order. And so, like, the dice go lowest to highest. So if you take the one ambulance that'll give you an early turn order in the next turn, you're getting the lowest dice from that turn. Uh, Whereas if you take the five, which would be the last choice in the next round, you get the highest dice. Um, But you put them into one of your wards on your little player board, and then you use your workers that you start with to kind of move around and activate different abilities on your board that allow you to manipulate the dice and the goal is to try and raise them to seven so once you would raise it like once it's at six if you would raise it again then it's discharged and you get points for discharging them Ah. if for some reason it ever they're at a one and they would decrease to zero then they die and they go to the morgue and i'm assuming they count as negative points at the end of the game um just like sweep them under something You're like nope there's nobody dead over here no nope. <laughs> uh so it's a lot of the reviews and things they have on the kickstarter from like rado and stuff talk about it being a really good like intro game but it looks like it actually might have some solid like meat to it and so i don't know i'm kind of interested i like worker placements and dice manipulation where but, like less- Less than dice rolling. Yeah, like like there's the initial roll, but then they get sorted out onto the car, onto the ambulances, and then from then on, they aren't rolled again. They're just manipulated. And yeah. I'm fine with dice manipulation. You could plan for that. Um, I like that the uh, the luxified ambulances have a little like I don't know the little hospital plus symbol, but it's all dice. Right. And then you can also put the dice in the ambulance on top of it. The three dice. It's really cool. Yeah, the deluxe one. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of just like a flat card with, you know, three little Spaces spots. On it. Yeah. You can have a whole ambulance to cart your uh, your dice your around. Your dice around, and yes, because that's not ridiculous. And like, I mean, if you're going to oh. deluxify something, fucking go. <laughs> <laughs> and they did. Yep. Clearly. So, um, yeah, that is... Dice Hospital. Dice Hospital. You got about a week. Take a look, because it looks good. Speaking of a game that looks good, uh, next up on Kickstarter is Monsterlands. Uh, Well-funded, $111,111 of its 29000 goal. Uh, 1,300 backers. This one's got about three weeks to go. You can get this one for $64 or $99 uh, for the addition that gets you actually all the stretch goals. This is the one I was thinking of with the two different tiers. Yes. Yeah, the leader one gets you leader stretch goals, and then the monster one, which is the $99, that gets you all stretch goals. Uh, so this one is kind of a worker placement resource management, again, with dice, uh, because hooray for blending genres. Indeed. Um, where all of you are different, like, clan leaders who are organizing fighting forces to help fight off the monsters that are invading this kingdom. Um I know one of the things they have is an add-on that like allows you to have a little bit of player conflict. Um, but for the most part, it's more of a semi-co-op where you're all working together to accomplish the same things, but there's definitely a winner. And yeah, you do a bunch of different things to get dice and you can use your dice as workers in the town to get like weapons and armor and spells and items. And then when you go out to fight, you use whatever dice you still have as 
attacks and things like that. And there's some rolling, I guess, when you fight. I Their rules overview on the Kickstarter itself is not the best. Uh-huh. Uh, but it gives you a rough idea of kind of what you're doing. And yeah, the components all, like, there's a whole lot of stuff in this game. Yeah. And like the first Kickstarter that's already unlocked is like wooden assignment tokens and things like that. So all the stuff is <laughs> looking like it's going to be pretty high quality. <clears throat> I like the art style a lot, too. Uh, I like the optional buys. They have glass monsters, and those are actually made by Rado's wife. Yes. Oh, glass monsters. Yep. Because his they're wife does a lot of cool little glass things. Super expensive. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, yeah, I would imagine they would be. Uh, it's 100 euros for a set of four. Ooh. Wow. Ah. Hachi machi. Uh, that might be, oh. No, oh, it's they're, they're for a first set of four. Yeah, I'll but it's, they're the first player markers, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can get the full set. So, yeah. $100. That's a lot. But you only need one. So, $32. <laughs> or, and that's 100 euros. Yeah. For all four, 32 euros for just yes. one. Yes. They look good, though. They do look pretty cool. Handmade. Uh, so, yeah. That's uh, Monster Lands. I really like the art. It's mm-hmm. cool. Looks good. Speaking of Deluxified. Indeed. Uh, next up is a Downfall Deluxified Edition. Uh, ninety-one thousand. It's forty-five thousand dollar goal. Nine hundred and fifty backers, and a little more than two weeks to go. This is another one of them. Their TMG Deluxified Kickstarters. Yep. And so this one is a four X game, uh, where there's a big common hex board, and everybody starts off on kind of different corners of the hex, and then you play a four X game. Expand, exploit, exterminate, and whatever the other X is that I can never extract. remember. Extract. Extract. But it's all sweet post-apocalyptic. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and this is by the guy that did Mystic Veil, vale too. Oh, that just upped my interest level a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for those of you not familiar with TMG's deluxified editions of games, uh, they are only available through the Kickstarters, and they have a whole bunch of upgraded components that are usually really nice. And so they're doing that again for this one. Yep. Um Previous ones are like Yokohama and Orléans, mm-hmm. and there was one other one that was really popular that had a deluxified edition. But uh, I, I mean, can't the, remember it. The Flow of History, that one was. Or we haven't, I haven't gotten it yet, but uh, they did one. Like they basically, it seems like that's just what they do now. Now, now it is. Like yeah. I'm pretty sure that's it going forward. But I don't think they did it. You know, for yeah. all time. No, no. Um, but yeah, this one has a bunch of metal coins, plastic airships instead of punch board airships, uh, plastic leaders. Um, player boards versus card stock, like punch board, um, and then... Metal uh, radiation tokens. Yeah. yeah. It, this looks really uh, pretty good, in my opinion. I really like 4X games. Uh, I typically play them on PC, but this one, I don't know, reading through the rules and kind of seeing what goes on, it looks like it could actually be a really solid board game. It plays up to six people. I am very curious... Um, how long a six-player game actually is versus how long I'm sure they say it is. Um, but, yeah. What is... It looks like... Was one of the tiers, like, upsized map tiles? Or is that just an option? Because this is worth 20 bucks, and the instead of being 88 millimeters, they're 112 millimeters for the tiles? Yeah, it is the pledge $100 or more, Downfall, Deluxified, plus Big Map. Um as well as the big map upsize. This tier includes all deluxified upgrades um, and the big map. So yeah, if you wanna if you wanna really go big and go for a hundred bucks instead of getting the eighty dollar deluxified, so an extra yep. twenty bucks to get a blown up map tiles. I mean, that might be worth it. Yeah, looks like there's quite a bit that can be going on on these tiles. Yeah, so having a little bit more space on them could be pretty awesome. That's where like Scythe's mm-hmm. uh, bigger map definitely came. came right, was nice. If you got space for it. Yes. So, yeah. I mean, I definitely think that the value from the $60 retail pledge to the, 20, the $80 Deluxify, that extra $20, what it gets you, seems very worth it. Uh, yeah, you go from 57 punch board radiation tokens to the 57 metal ones that Jeff was talking about, from 30 punch board airships to plastic airships, plastic leader miniatures, punch board player boards, and wooden survivor tokens instead of punch board survivor tokens. And just... just- for clarification, as of right now, there are four backers for the downfall standard and 308 <laughs> for the deluxified. Yeah. And then 544 for the big map. <laughs> so yeah. Impressive. Yep. So that is downfall. Yep. You got uh, about a little over two weeks, a little less three weeks, somewhere between two and three weeks. 
<laughs> uh, last up on Kickstarter is Legends of Sleepy Hollow. Uh, just barely funded so far. Uh, 50,000 of its 49,000 goal. Uh, 732 backers and a little more than two weeks left. You can pledge this one for $69 and $109. Yeah, so Legends of Sleepy Hollow is being produced by Dice Hate Me Games, whose owner, Chris Kirkman, is a member, founder, host on the State of Games podcast, which is a fellow member of Punchboard Media. Ooh. So I know he was very excited to have Legends of Sleepy Hollow fund, and we're excited to take a little bit of time to talk about it. So this is a cooperative game uh, for one to four players, and one of the designers, uh, Matt Riddle, it also worked on Wasteland Delivery Service, which you got at Gen Con, right, Zach? Yes. As did Paul. Yeah, Paul hasn't opened his. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, these are the same guys that did the uh, deck building, the deck building game as well. Yes. Yeah. And time management, the time management game, and compounded trader mechanic, the trader mechanic game. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> like I said, it's a one to four player co op game, and you're taking on the role of residents of uh, Terrytown and six zelda reference <laughs> <laughs> and so it's a miniature based uh campaign game where you are moving around uh, the different maps and investigating mysteries and trying to uh solve whatever is going down um although it is legends of sleepy hollow it's not necessarily all about ichabod crane is that the sleepy hollow guy correct correct yeah it's not necessarily all about all that um not necessarily a pumpkin riding murderer or anything going on. Uh, there's eight chapters that have a bunch of different mystery and things going on. And each chapter is separate from them. So you'll be able to discover secrets as you play. I really like the uh, the player boards that this come with. Uh, it's multi-layered ones. Uh, with, Everything should be multi-layered player yeah. boards from now on. Uh, with recessed well, wells. One of the other really cool things is I've never seen this before in any games that I've owned or played. It's got a hinge top game box. Hinge top game box. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. Yeah. That's not like some four hundred dollar limited edition wood box or something. No, no, that's part of the normal sixty nine dollar plus. The only other hinge boxes are those well, like yeah, crazy yeah, yeah. I think like Small World had that wooden edition or whatever. Right. That was insane. Um but yeah. The minis look real good. Uh the plastic gobkins. Uh I really like they're like skeleton goblin things. They look really cool. Um, it's like a it's like it's like a if a pumpkin grew a body out of vines. Yeah. It's a good description, Jeff. Because that's what it is. Yeah. The uh <laughs> the the thing I really like about all these minis is that they have uh health tracker spinners that attach to the bottom of them. So like as you oh, that's pretty take cool. damage or as you damage an enemy, you can turn the little spinner to mark what its current health is. Rather than having to like keep track of it through some weird like card thing or having a dice floating around by it or whatever, um, yeah, tons of wooden bits, a full like nice bound storybook um, for the higher pledged tier. No, uh, oh yeah, there is an art book for the higher yeah, pledged there, tier, but... yeah, there's a hardcover art book for the higher pledged tier. For the regular one though, it has a 24 page storybook with cardstock pages and is like nicely bound. Yeah. Yeah, like this is a really solid game with a lot of quality components. So save thirty dollars uh, now. Yeah, Kickstarter. Yeah, it really looks nice. Yeah, I'm definitely at least somewhat interested in this. Um, you know, sometimes cooperative storytelling games aren't my jam. Cough, cough, Arabian Nights. But it's not quite cooperative. <laughs> yeah, but this is. Um, but this looks much more game like as you explore the tiles and actually have fights and things. Seems much more like something I'd be interested in. So uh, excited to check out and hear more about yeah. it. And did you hear? Did you say that it had free shipping for the U.S. and Canada? Yes. Okay. I think. I don't know. You did now. Yep. Did now. <laughs> free shipping for the U.S. and Canada, which uh, if you go to the comment section, uh, there's a lot of people who are like, why do you hate Europeans? It's like, well... You can't really sure get a lot of reasons. Europeans, no. <laughs> <laughs> Let so me go through many, all the reasons. So many reasons. <sighs> country by country. <laughs> well, but yeah, so I know it's been driving him nuts. He's like, it's not that I hate Europeans. Like, it's, it's just the it, realities of shipping. I can, I would go broke if I shipped to, to Europe for free. Like, yeah. I can manage to include that in the cost for, you know, things here in North America. But international shipping tends to be quite expensive. Personally, I'm surprised Canada's on the uh, free shipping list as well. Like, I know... Yeah. 
trying to ship things to Canada can <clears throat> be prohibitively expensive. Brutal. Brutal. Looks like you'd receive it around December 2018, if you didn't already say that, too. Oh. So another year. Yeah. yeah. Nice long delivery time frame. Um, but yeah. Some would say a realistic delivery time frame. Oh, yes. Indeed. So yeah. yeah, so check out uh, Sleepy Hollow. If Legends. If that sounds interesting to you. Legends of Sleepy Hollow. Of Sleepy Hollow. And that's it for Kickstarters. It is indeed it for Kickstarters. Forever. For um, this week. Which brings us to the listener feedback portion of the show, where Jeff gets to say emails a whole lot. So first up, at emails at milehighgameguys.com, if you would like to email us, uh, we have one email, one long email. Uh, <laughs> this email comes from our friend Andrew, um, titled, I guess I never sent this last week, dot, dot, dot. Uh, on bias in history. <clears throat> Basically, what Wes said about journalists knowing their own bias is true in history and archaeology as well, and maybe on steroids. First, you have specific philosophical camps. For instance, Marxist historians exist and aren't necessarily communists politically. They just have view, they just view class as the most important driver in history. Uh, you can get into a whole great man versus zeitgeist debate, although I think mostly historians nowadays will take a little from column A and a little bit from column B. In archaeology in the 60s, there was a major movement called processionalism. Pro processualism. <laughs> it's the first I've ever read or heard of that <laughs> word. Uh, that thought, holy cow, we've got all these new scientific tools. We can test our theories like they do in the harder sciences. Now we'll be more accurate than ever. Then in the 80s, the post processionalists uh, popped up saying, y'all are idiots. We can use science as a tool, but we can't test our theories like they do. We can't pretend like we aren't biased. Uh, we live in a modern society that structures the way we think so deeply that we can't get around it. We have to know where we're coming from to understand why we have the idea ideas we have about the past. It's still ongoing. Uh, I mostly agree with the post-processualists, uh, but really, I mostly wanted to make, say, <laughs> processionalism <laughs> and post-processualist as much as possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Processualist. I'll have to Google what that actually means later. Uh, on the whole y'all debate, uh, there used to be a time when English did have a separate word uh, for the plural you, and it was you. It was you. Uh, the singular was thou, uh, but then you kept encroaching because everyone has to be polite. Well, I'm sick of this political correctness. Send it back to where it belongs, I say. Make English Shakespearean again. Uh, or, <laughs> or maybe we can adopt uh, a Yorkshire accent. Uh, I were having fun writing this because it liked make Jeff read strange things. Thou art right best host. <laughs> Great accent, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> Very Yorkshire. Yeah. I'm, I don't I'm, know what a Yorkshire accent is. I'm certain all our British uh, fans will appreciate Jeff's we have British, Yorkshire we have, accent. We have British fans? I, we definitely I, have some. Uh, I don't know what a Yorkshire accent sounds like. Somebody needs to send us an audio clip of a Yorkshire accent. Yorkshire. To, uh, to our email. Uh, but seriously, yes, the English have has managed to survive for 400 years with singular plural uh, confusion in the second person. However, it's really annoying, and if y'all can't f can fix that, I'm all for it. Also, if we could adopt the way the Finnish have of differentiating between we that includes the person you are talking to and a we that doesn't include them, that would be great. Thanks. It's, you, you do a motion with your hand. It's like, we, Jeff, we over here, we're going to get something cool. We're going to do, do this. Yeah. You are not part of that we. Yeah. You can go fuck yourself. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just always add the add that at the end. Yeah. Uh, finally, Matryoshka was a lot of fun, but I feel after listening to y'all explain it, like I understand it uh, less than I did after playing it. Not an easy game to describe. Uh, I'll see you all tonight. Hey, that works for when I sent this, send this, and also when I listen to Jeff say it, just not for when Jeff actually says it. Well, two out of three ain't bad. Ain't well, it. I have a surprise for you, Jeff. Come on out now. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that was that was fantastic. I'm really enjoying this trend of people sending us emails that are intentionally hard for Jeff to read. <laughs> I know how to read and write. <laughs> 
It's like the it's, Charlie it's Kelly speak. of the podcast. No, it's speak. That's where. It, that's where. <laughs> it yeah, it. what the, the the reading and the speaking at the same time, especially when it's your first time reading said thing. <laughs> Pro- yeah, processualism. I'm hoping that's what that is. Yeah, I think it comes from the whole fact that they were really excited to be able to use the scientific process to do things in archaeology and history. Yeah, and so. then they'd be all biased about stuff. Yep. Yeah. Uh, thank you for continuing to send us amazingly in depth and. Uh, educational emails, Andrew. We like that. Thou art right, best host. <laughs> if you would like to send us emails for me to read, uh, that would be emails at milehighgameguys.com. Yep. Uh, Zach, we have some VGG responses to previous episodes. We do. That we need to catch up on. <clears throat> this first one is from two episodes ago for a discussion part two, review biases. Uh, this first one is from Danielle from Draft Mechanic. It reads... Okay, so I know this sort of skirts around a lot of what you guys were talking about uh, on the two paid reviews slash biases episodes, uh, but Cialdini's influence principles are a very cool thing, and your discussions really got me thinking about them. According to Robert C., there are six principles. <laughs> That's cheating. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it's my section, Jeff. I'll do what I want. <laughs> Um, there are six principles of influence, and pretty much all of them get involved in the board game review process somewhere. Reciprocity, scarcity, authority, liking, consistency, and consensus. Authority and liking are the most obvious. Unless you really like screaming into the void, you probably like the reviewers whose content you consume, and whether it is warranted or not, the status of being a reviewer who looks at games all the time comes with a certain perception of authority. Especially if you add on top of the of it the idea that review copies are essentially an endorsement from a board game company which confers more authority liking is also often brought up uh, from the reviewer's standpoint since as you make friends in the board game industry you are more likely to be swayed by liking uh, consensus and scarcity are also kind of work hand in hand here uh, often games are reviewed before they are widely available again especially if they are review copies uh, since the content consumer can't easily get the game they have no real way to evaluate it on their own, so they will look to their opinion of others. Which, if they are all from reviewers who who got the game for free slash were paid to talk about it, well, you can see where this is going. It obviously adds to the hype machine and the Kickstarter madness, too. Scarcity might also influence reviewers themselves into thinking better of a game, since having a scarce item, a game that's not out yet, increases the perceived value of that item. Uh, consistency has two effects as well. If I listen to a review and say, oh man, that sounds cool, I want to buy that. The consistent thing for me to do later is to actually buy it. Also, I have found a reviewer with whom I actually agree. The consistent thing for me to do if they review a game positively is to agree with their assessment, which is bad is that if this isn't genuine, possibly due to compensation. From a reviewer's perspective, this falls right in line with your biases talk. If you always like social deduction games, you are more likely to go into a social deduction game expecting to like it. This is partially true if you have made it part of your identity, i.e., I'm the reviewer who loves social deduction games on my show. Also, we would not get along. (laughs) Uh, Which leaves us with reciprocity. If a game company gives you a game, or money, or a golden tuna the size of a Winnebago, you're more likely to do this thing that they want, which, while it is stated as, review this game, is understood as, review this game well. The good news is that none of this is guaranteed to work. As Wes mentioned in the biases episode, these are all brain shortcuts, and if you take the time to think critically, they can all be overcome. Of course, this requires uh, waiting until there is enough evidence that you can not only evaluate the game with it, but use it to decide what evidence is an outlier and possibly suspect. As for reviewers, I feel like engaging in this level of critical thinking to notice the factors uh, that are influencing your opinion is part of what makes you good at what you do. Awesome. That means we're the best because we recorded like four hours of bias and reciprocity. (laughs) Reciprocity. (laughs) Um, Yeah, no, and I think things like this are really interesting. um, Just even from like completely separate from board games. Things like this are really interesting to me. um, Just how the human brain in so many ways is not necessarily set up to function well in our modern world. Like we're the process of, you know, a ton of evolution that has pushed us in certain directions that, you know, made sense when we were hunter gatherers or when we were, you know, even before hunter gatherer stuff, when we're basically just animals. And then now that we're in a modern world with modern society, things like those can be taken advantage of with things like anchoring and and like the whole six principles of influence here. Um, Also, it'd be nice if we could do a Google search in our brain. Yes. 
That would be handy. Because <laughs> um, like, I know, I know, I talked about this, and then you just think, and then you know, when your brain gets occupied with something else, two two weeks later, you're like, oh fuck, that's what it was. God damn it. Yeah. So I don't know. I think things like that are really interesting, and I'm glad we were able to apply some of those like more higher level concepts to our discussion about things like biases and objectivity. So hopefully, y'all did too. Y'all. <clears throat> y'all. Uh, another episode that we had some feedback for was our Lisboa review. Yes. Uh, here we go. Uh, so Daniel said, The discussion about theming in this game was pretty interesting. If someone was interested in the city of Lisbon and the rebuilding of the city, this game seems like it would be very thematic and more fun because of it. But generally, people would rather fight demons, use lightsabers, and cast fireballs than rebuild a specific city. I mean, if I could do that while rebuilding the city, yeah. now, now you're speaking Fantasy theme building rebuilding no okay no not not fantasy. <laughs> high, real high fantasy with uh, lightsabers and yes, fireballs yeah uh-huh. and dragons not demons. so the dark tower yeah <laughs> uh, i think i could get into lisboa if i watched a documentary on the rebuilding of lisbon or read a book on it first i probably won't do that so the interest level is low unfortunately <laughs> i'm sure there's a good documentary out there about it somewhere yeah i wouldn't be surprised i can definitely understand like if you see that on your the shelf and you're just like that's about rebuilding the city. I don't know. Like I well, just looking at it on the yes. shelf, you don't know that's what it's about. Like well, I know I mean, but looking on the back, like I can understand that some like just like oh, this is just about rebuilding a city or something. Like it, it for me at least, it didn't speak out to me at all. Which and that's fair. Like especially knowing that you don't tend to like the kind of drier Euro yes. themes. Like you know because you have stuff like Agricola where it's mm-hmm. farming yeah. in medieval times mm-hmm. or La Havre where it's you know shipping and construction in industrial times yep. like those are all very dry themes you know like for me yeah that but yeah i think it also speaks for the people i think lisboa is i don't want to say it's not for the people that just base it off a of theme real realistically but that's sort of what i'm saying if that makes sense <laughs> yeah uh the the people that'd be into lisboa are ones that are like i don't it's gonna be two categories of people it's gonna be the people who don't care about theme yeah like People like me who just like good mechanics. And yeah. Like when the theme ties into mechanics a little bit. Or it's going to be people who are like super psyched about rebuilding Lisboa. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, the next one is from Matt. Great review, guys. I need to play this game some more, as well as Vital's other masterpieces. Uh, that was a fun review overall to listen to, and I agreed with most of the points, good and bad. I still have Gallerist as my top Vital game for now. Uh, which it's in, I should also note that, so that was Matt from Cardboard Carnage. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kyle, who was on for the Lisboa review, he has played Gallerist since that review, and he likes Gallerist more as well. Uh, yeah. That seems to be a pretty wide consensus. I think that for most people, Gallerist is just so much more accessible than Lisboa that it's going to make it more people's favorites. Not me, though. but Not you. Don't. But, but me. Yeah. VTOL's yeah. games in general don't click for you. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, Derek says, after listening to this review, I've got to say this is why the Mile High Game Guys has become one of my top podcasts. You guys approach a game from all angles and from varying tastes. Even when the game misses the mark for one of you, you give it a fair shake and can still give credit to its strong points. Well done, review, and I enjoy listening. Keep up the great work. Yes. Which, thank you, Derek. We really yes. appreciate that. I mean, that's definitely one of the things that we try to go for. Like, we think that is one of the strengths that we have also, is that... We all have different tastes. It's one of it's one of the pillars of Mile High Game, guys. One of yeah. those other pillars, cursing, cur- cursing, cursing, and the other, <laughs> other one is strong opinions. <laughs> and the fourth one to make a nice square pillar shape uh-huh. is berating each other. Oh yes, our differing opinions. And then the center one that is hold up everything. It is actually the pillar that is hold everything else just for decoration. Uh-huh. Is terraforming Mars? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, if you would like to chime in on any of our past episodes, you can jump over to our Board Game Geek Guild, Guild number 2731, where Zach does those awesome posts uh, to let you know what is coming down the pike and where and you can all, go comment, comment afterwards. And they're all very entertaining. Yes. So you should read them, whether you want to post or not. Yes, definitely if, go over there. Uh, if you subscribe, if you join the guild and subscribe, then you just get the notifications right there on your BGG page. Indeed. Very convenient. So. I'd, I'd say upvote it, but that's not how it works. No. You can, you you can, can thumb, thumb it. it, though. There you go. Give it a good thumb. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so you can find us on BGG. You can also email us. Emails at milehighgameguys.com. We're on Facebook and Instagram slash milehighgameguys. 
I tweet under at MH Game Guys. I am Zach underscore MHGG. And I am Jeff underscore MHGG. And yeah, if you like the content we're producing, we definitely urge you to go check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash milehighgameguys. See if any of those pledge tiers are enticing to you. Uh, and we, if you want certain rewards, make sure you pledge at the appropriate level. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you could pledge at the one dollar. Yeah, no, that's right. But if you, you yes. want. but if you want a specific reward, pledge at the right tier. Um, yeah, we we're just able to upgrade some uh, mics, headsets, and pop filters for our guests, which is awesome. Slightly less. Again, thanks to uh, our awesome, generous patrons. Indeed. Yes. Thank you. Many, many generous ones. Yeah. What are you? Dozens. Dozens. <laughs> yeah. Literally dozens. <clears throat> Also, if you are looking to connect with the hosts more, you can join our Slack channel. There is a link in the show notes uh, at milehighgameguys.com. That may so, or may not constantly break for some reason. I think I've straightened that out, I hope. But of course, I thought that before and then it still broke. So Just angrily tweet at Adrian if it's yes, not Yes, if it doesn't uh-huh. work, just tweet at me and I'll fix it immediately. <clears throat> angrily tweet. Lots of exclamation points. Yes. Yeah, feel free to swear also. I respond well to swearing. Um you fucking piece of shit. <laughs> yep. uh, be sure to tune in this Friday when we will be releasing our episode uh, discussing more so than reviewing uh, dexterity games. We have a whole bunch of them that we've wanted to talk about for a while, but we didn't feel that any of them was quite enough for a full review. So we're just going to smash them all together in kind of a general discussion of dexterity games, particularly of the take that fuck you variety where you're trying to like set somebody else up to fail at dexterity dick move related the games game. dick move the game yep um that'll be this friday and then also this friday there will be a bgg post up for next week's review topic which will be a review of the classic two-player cold war game twilight struggle yes former number one former on number game one Geek. on bgg yep. uh we are going to dive very deep into this awesomeness of america versus russian cold war influence and soviets slightly outright warfare yeah um yeah i'm really looking forward to that one i know jeff is yeah my, zach i don't know maybe is my first play was when we were at pork chops waiting to watch ufc or something yeah <laughs> we were was... like we we're like well they're all playing the other seven sins let's go play twilight struggle for the first time <laughs> <laughs> It was, was, like, it was like my third or fourth time, but it but had been my, a while. It was, it, it was my struggled. first time. Yeah. But we'll talk about that more next week when Indeed. we review it. Yep. So, uh, Zach will have a post up for that on BGG Friday, and you can give us your questions, comments, concerns that we will address during the review. Yes. I am. Well, I hope everybody's enjoyed this episode, and we will uh, catch you next time. Until then, I've been Adrian. I am still Zach. And I'm Nexus 8 Jeff. And we'll catch you all later. Bye. 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 Philosophical. <laughs> really? I was th- I, in my head. I was like physiological, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, "Wait, I need to." Uh, this clearly needs to be close to my face. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> then in the eighties, the post procession. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> Processionalists. I'm hoping that's how it's pronounced. Uh, I mostly agree with the post processionalists. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what a processionalist is. That's that's the problem. This is what I have to look forward to. <laughs> uh-huh. Enjoy your uh, board game geek reading there, uh, Thou Art Best Host, Zach. I will. Yeah, so as was essentially just spoiled. There. But, hmm, Caldini's? Cialdini's? Cialdini's. That's how I'd say it. I don't okay. know. All right. Uh, oh. <laughs> uh-huh, yeah. uh-huh. No, no, no. Yeah, uh, go fuck yourself, yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Reciprocal. Reciprocal. Apparently, Reciprocal. I need to start reading everything. No, reciprocity. No, no. Reciprocity? Ugh, yeah. That's, uh, yeah. I uh-huh. know it's supposed to be reciprocal. That's where it's just like, yeah. Say it one more time. <laughs> reciprocity. Reci- reciprocity. Reci- that reciprocity. Just, re- that just sounds wrong. It does. <laughs> yeah. Brunch board media. Where we all bring something to the table. Pull up a chair at punchboardmedia.com. <laughs>